the science of diet versus diet plus exercise, or uh, as I have stated here, diet versus exercise. This, this was a bit of an endeavor that I just wish I had a little bit more time. I, I went through three meta analyses and I, and I wished once I had done that, I had time to really sort through some of the citations to, to, to show you how diverse some of these studies are. Because what I, what I want you guys to consider as we start unraveling this, uh, there, there are so many different ways you could test this and they have for more than 50 years. So you could say, I'm gonna test diet versus exercise. And this has been tested where you just give somebody like diet counseling, here's what you should eat, go, go home and, and do this. Then another group, you could say, just here are these exercises, no diet modifications, just here, just go do exercise. So two sets of behavioral changes, maybe without even any real parameters, you know, the, the nutrition people not necessarily tracking macros or in an inpatient ward where they're only being fed a certain amount, but just to say, hey, if we approach this from the side of nutrition or the side of exercise, who wins? Or you could do a test where people truly do have a very, very controlled diet on both sides, but then another group also you control and increase their exercise. So now you can see how much more the exercise might give you, if anything. You can look at these as short-term or long-term studies, which they have. Uh, if you're incorporating or teaching or training on the nutrition side versus the exercise side or both together, where are these people two years from now, 10 years from now? D did they have any long-term effect from the approach? And they've even studied those kind of things. So this was really hard to nail down uh, an exact type of epi epidemiological study where I could say, okay, exercise gives you this, diet gives you this, combine it gives you this, here are the numbers and there, there's the presentation. We can all go home now and, and we have all the correct information. But there still are some really, really cool things to see in this. And, and I'm gonna go through them here one at a time. So the, the, the first case study was in, of course, you can see the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and it was pretty wide. They, uh, they wanted to look at a lot of different variables. So they, they, they kind of just wanted to see which approach works best. If you were a consumer, you could go to your doctor and just get a prescription drug. Give me Fenfen, give me Meridia, give me, give me something else. Uh, or go in for just weight loss counseling or exercise or both. They even looked at supplements, like people taking just extra fiber, like Metamucil or CLA or something else, you know, all the different things that people will, will tend to do. So th they looked at all of those different things and, and they compared a, a pretty, pretty wide swath of, of, of approaches. Then this particular study, uh, and it says it's a meta-analysis of the, of the past 25 years, but look at the date. It was in the International Journal of Obesity in 1997. So you're looking at almost the 25 years previous to the last 25 years, uh, which is kind of cool because then I have another one that almost fills in the gap on, on the other side of that. So they were looking at a, a little bit more narrow focus, looking at just diet versus versus exercise, versus diet plus exercise. So those three categories. Then the final meta-analysis uh, looked, at, 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 again, at very, very tight, looking at just, you know, what does nutrition do? What does diet do? But a uh, little bit more current, I believe, uh, at least 2009. So, so they were they're at least the, the decade after that, this one was done at uh, University of Cincinnati, uh, right over there near Dr. Kevin Brunacini. Okay, so let's look at uh, the things that I had mentioned here. Uh, you know, diet versus exercise, diet versus diet plus exercise. Uh, they, again, I said, looked at these med losses or, or looked at uh, medications and how they might affect weight loss. Um, they, 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 there was different information on what actually caused the most acute weight loss and what caused the most long-term weight loss. So this is where some of those little nuances ended up playing a big role. So in that very first study where they just pretty much threw everything into wall to see what would stick, uh, here, here's what I like about what they did. Uh, they broke this down, you know, each, each one of these meta analyses has the opportunity to look at virtually any study they want. 
And one of the next ones I'm going to show you, they started out uh, with, with almost 1,600 studies to look at. And it, in a particular meta-analysis, you, you obviously you don't want to look at that many unless you're just doing some kind of crazy big data analysis. You want to you want to refine the search by saying, you know, what what studies don't really fit my criteria? What am I looking for? And so one of the one of the meta analyses I'm going to show you said they wanted to make sure that that every single study was at least for six months. And other people would say, well, we want to make sure it, you know, it, it controls for this. It's, you know, that the control group and the study group have to both experience both things, you know, kind of a, a cross trial. Uh, you know, they, they, whatever the researchers' goals are, that's how they winnow down the, the studies they're actually going to look at. Um, this particular study, uh, they even looked at low calorie diets, which are typically in research categorized at like 1500 to, uh, you know, 1800 calories, somewhere in there. That, that would be, you know, it's, it's what probably any one of us as coaches would say, that's it's probably pretty necessary. Like that's about the calorie range that you need. You're in a calorie deficit. A very low calorie diet is medically something that's around 500 calories a day. So they wanted to check those. They wanted to even see almost like the National Weight Registry Review. They, they, they wanted to look at different ways of even eating. Like, like what if we just increase somebody's protein? Does, does that give them an advantage over not increasing somebody's protein? Uh, they, they looked at using meal replacements, which is, as you guys know, the old school meal replacement package that has carbohydrate in it, as well as protein, kind of a vitamin base. So the old metrics or, or uh, EAS, you know, packets. Uh, and, uh, you know, here's, here's the lowdown. For acute weight loss, drugs win, okay? So uh, not, not ch chalk one up for the pharmaceutical companies. W when you do something that directly impacts your appetite or ability to absorb you know, calories, that then there is an advantage. Most of them, of course, are, are stimulants. Most of them are very appetite suppressant. Uh, but at the same time, we also know as coaches and dieters that a good meal replacement is kind of an appetite suppressant. If you have something that does control for glycemic index load and it has enough protein in it, uh, if you guys are on your game, you're being very sound and nutritionally consistent, then you know a meal like that is A, it's controlled calorically. It's got the macros that you know you can rely on. And uh, B, it's, it's going to keep you sated for probably a good meal cycle, probably up to three hours. And so that becomes kind of part of your routine. So, so that was number one. Number two was just having somebody increase protein in their diet. Hey, if you eat more protein a day, you got to get your protein up to this level. Those people were very successful at acutely losing body fat. Uh, the third most effective in this meta-analysis, looking at, at over 20 studies, looking at all the studies they did, and then kind of, as, as I said, pulling it down to the 20 that met their criteria, uh, then if you actually say, okay, not only are you going to have high protein, but now we're going we're gonna to reduce your fat. We're going to make sure this is a low-fat diet. We're going to make sure your carbohydrates are mostly whole food, low glycemic, low carbs. And so that was pretty effective. The least effective thing they looked at in this whole meta-analysis was exercise. They said, if you just tell somebody here, go work out, go run every day, don't worry about nutrition or food, but, but we're going we're gonna to compare exercise as a single variable to all the different other diet interventions, exercise didn't do jack. I mean, there, there were a lot of studies where people just didn't lose weight because as we know, if you're not accounting for nutrition or diet, sometimes just exercising more makes you hungrier. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many runners I have counseled who are trying to lose body fat and, and they are primarily a runner. They're a runner who wants to lose weight. And typically they'll say, this is a great time for me to do this because I'm getting, I'm training for a marathon or I'm training for a mini marathon, a half marathon. And so let's start, let's start reducing calories and controlling that, that uh, energy deficit. It never goes well. Runners, when, when they're increasing their mileage and their intensity, they typically gain weight. They don't lose weight. For that reason, we get so hungry the more cardio we do, the, the more intensity we include in our training. 
So when I get through these things that I want to show you in, in the various studies, I do want to save enough time for just a, a, a very practical analytical conversation. Because though exercise was, was the least um, impactful variable for weight loss, guess what the most important variable was for long-term weight loss and maintenance? Exercise. So it was the people when they check in with them six months later, a year later, two, two years later, it was the people, it, it, it was those groups that would say, yeah, now look at us. You know, we lost, we, we may have only lost like two or three pounds during that six months during the study, which underperformed versus the diet interventions. But then they lost another couple, then they lost another couple, then they lost another couple. Whereas the people who would do just a diet intervention alone, we know that rate of recidivism tends to be very, very high. We know that 95% of people gain all of their weight back after a couple of years. We know at least one stat I've, I've encountered is that, you know, at the end of five years, most people who ever started to diet, you know, weigh substantially more. And so exercise tends to be that long-term anchor piece, but let's, let's look at these other two meta analyses. Actually, this was, um, I know you guys can't read this. I just wanted to throw this in there for my own records, but this, this kind of broke it down into the, the exact amount of weight loss each group lost. And, and one of the things that did surprise me here what, was that in the exercise column, if you looked at that very bottom category, if you could see that, uh, don't, don't break your, your computer trying if, if you can't. But out of all of the studies that they funneled into the exercise only group, there were two or three studies that did show substantial loss that like almost more than every other category. But then there were also a couple of studies that, that showed either none or slight gains. So as a net group, and this is what you're stuck with as a meta-analysis, you're not just cherry picking one study that's, you know, proves your point. You're looking at every study that fits your criteria, whether you like the outcome or not. So in aggregate, the exercise group was the least performing for acute weight loss, the greatest performing for long-term weight loss. But even in that, that acute phase where it did not perform well, there were some studies where it did. So th this is where sometimes looking at the citations through a study, like if you're looking at reading, reading some kind of a literature review like this, sometimes picking apart some of the individual studies that they looked at, or at least comparing them gives you so some interesting nuance other than just their own conclusions. So study number two, uh, this time, instead of just 20 studies, they actually included 493. So some serious statisticians here. And this was a little bit more straightforward in that they were really just comparing those three variables, diet, exercise, or diet plus exercise. So in this much, much larger study, this one, again, going for a 25 year span, they showed that just without question, diet plus exercise was most effective. It was most effective, acute, long-term, et cetera. So this is different than that first one I showed you because that this fir the first one I showed you did not break it down this way. They were just looking at the differences between drugs, this diet intervention, that diet intervention, supplements, or exercise as individual variables. So um, I think this is where we could all just kind of say, okay, duh, like, you know, diet plus exercise instead of one of those alone, you know, of, of course that should, that should work, that, that checks out with our logic. But I think it's really important on the heels of what we learned through that first meta-analysis, which is that without diet intervention, exercise alone is not that impactful. It's just not. If you do both, I think you're really hitting the home run. And, and let, me, let me put it to you this way. I, I just sat down this morning with a, a woman who's, who's going to be a new client. So she's here locally. And um, she really, you know, she's, she's you know, it, let's, let's say middle-aged. You know, she's not, a, she's not a spring chicken. She's, uh, you know, she's, she's an adult. And she said, you know, as I've gotten older, you know how you just get that little extra 
poochiness, that roundness. Your body's not the same as when you're a teenager. She only has about 15 pounds she wants to lose. She doesn't have 100 pounds to lose or 150 pounds to lose. And, uh, you know, her, her eating habits were pretty good. You know, she told me what she eats for lunch and breakfast and dinner. And she said, I'm just not really a snacker. So I just kind of stick to those. And when we got to her exercise habits, she said, yeah, I mean, I've, I've kind of done it all, but I just don't love it. I haven't done anything in a while. Um, if you're going to make me, I guess I will, but I just kind of hate it. Um, so I, I said, okay, look, you know, lucky for you, I've been reading all of this data for the last couple of days, and you are the perfect candidate to apply this kind of information. If you just started exercising, I think you could really go a long way because you want to change the shape of your body. You want to lose a little bit of body fat. You already have great nutrition habits. You probably have the genetics to, to you know, not even feel a lot of hunger. Obviously, you're not, you're not a binger. You're not a snacker. So you got to have some great genes in there somewhere. Um, so I, I really think exercise, you know, is, is key, but then I explained to her the phenomena of the metabolic switch. And I said, you know, if you, if you focus on nutrition as your primary and, and you really kind of get in that position where you're losing body fat faster and it's easier, it just feel great. I said, I, I, I know you'll get there faster. You'll, you'll have that acute speed that will get your attention. You'll be happy you did this. But if that's all we did and we didn't address the training portion, it's easier to let those pounds creep back on. And it's, it's not really going to change the shape and the strength and the vitality of your physique, I think, like you want. So I was able to give her this other example. You've heard me talk about uh, a couple of clients of mine who came to see me also, you know, above 50 years old. And this couple had never been really big on training or exercise. And I was able to tell her that this couple also didn't have a, you know, they weren't in bad, bad shape whatsoever. Uh, the gentleman in just the last two and a half months, he's lost 20 pounds. His wife has lost 15 pounds he's now eating up to maintenance levels of calories. Like we just started shifting his food intake up because he's lean. Like the dude's shredded, like triceps, you know, you know, 54 year old guy who just looks that great. And I said, you know, he wouldn't have done that alone with, with, with diet alone. He wouldn't have done it with exercise alone, but look what he was able to do. And his wife, she's also, she, she wants to lose a few more pounds, but she's really close behind him. And so I said, when you hit that tandem, then you have the ability to throttle back on the nutrition when it's time for maintenance, but you're going to carry forward those habits of the training that does increase your, your functionality and, and just how you feel. So, so I think that's an important backdrop to keep, guys. When we look at something like this, that seems like, well, okay, duh, of course you should do diet and exercise, but the research does show kind of the acute combination of both. But then, as I said, that the exercise portion is really that anchor piece. So, um, you know, here's, here's in, you know, to, to be honest, it's, it's not even stunningly different when you look at the acute um, changes. It really has more to do with the long-term sustainability. So, um, you know, if, if you look at the average, let's see, so 15, 20, 13 weeks, body fat percentage, initial BMI. Um, one of the things that was interesting here that I wanted to show you guys, th th this isn't even the results. I think I've got that on the next page, is that even when you are compiling with a meta-analysis, every single study you add does change your, your metrics, the, the criteria or the, the, the variable list. So one of the things they noted in this study is that the exercise group, they tended to already be a little bit on the younger side and had, had the lowest amount of body fat to lose. So if you did a statistical analysis showing the percent of body fat change or body composition change, then the exercise group actually does kind of come on a little bit stronger. Uh, they didn't do this for that first study, but they, they did account for it in the second and showed that, you know, hey, that there, are, there are some qualitative aspects to this, not just quantitative. 
But then uh, here are the actual results. You can see that, uh, you know, diet, they had lost, uh, gosh, that, that's over 20 pounds, uh, almost 11 kilos. And then exercise alone. So no diet intervention, just go exercise. They, they actually did still lose, uh, you know, more than six pounds. And then with the diet and the exercise combined, uh, like I said, it, it wasn't that much of a difference that, you know, combined, you didn't go from losing 11 kilos to, you know, 20 or 22, you just kind of fortified that. And then, as I said, you're probably looking at a much uh, more sustained uh, long-term intervention, which you can see the bottom line here, weight loss maintained at one year. That's when all of a sudden the diet and the exercise really started to separate themselves. So let's, uh, let's go on to this third study. So this is where it started out just massive. And, and just as a little research point, starting with 1,600 um, possible selections that, that, that they, they looked at, uh, they right away cut it down to 63. And I think that was because their, their biggest criteria point was it had to be at least a six-month study. And as I always kind of whine about in exercise science and nutrition research, there are just a lot of six-week studies, eight-week studies, 12-week if you're lucky. Um, so, so for a study to look this far into the future and, and really track people is, is kind of important. But then they ended up going all the way down to 18 studies because they really, really, really wanted to compare apples to apples. They wanted to see if you know if we if we manipulate anything with these groups whatsoever does it does it make a change having met those criteria and, and i'll just read this to you in their final discussion point in this meta-analysis of 18 randomized trials we found that interventions including combined diet and exercise produced greater long-term weight loss than interventions that only included a diet program the difference in weight loss was significantly greater for interventions with a duration more than a year uh, than for that of the shorter durations. So really kind of confirmed, <coughs> excuse me, what, uh, what we talked about in that second study. But the, the points that I would bring up to you, I've, I've mentioned briefly already, diet plus exercise is of course the clear winner. Uh, the exercise alone is the, is the, the anchor piece that you not only, you know, does it, does it not do that much because you do need the, the nutrition piece, but you've got to have that for the long term. But think of it as, as I often describe structure and flexibility. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're trying to create just a food metaphor, you know, you're not going to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich without peanut butter and, and jelly. And I think that the exercise is that cornerstone piece that really gives you that long-term sustenance. So, so if we look at peanut butter as having, you know, the fat, protein, heavier type elements, pick your own metaphor if you like. I just happened to pick peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't think I've ever had a peanut butter sandwich without jelly. I don't think I've ever had a jelly sandwich without peanut butter. It's just kind of those things that go together. So the, on the, the acute side the diet is going to give you everything you need. And I think just like the client I met with this morning, she articulated something that I've heard probably 99.9% .9 of the consultation times I've done for 25 years. She said, I just want to learn what I need to do. She, she was somebody who was, who was kind of that self-reliant. She said, if you just show me what to do, because there's so much information out there, misinformation, who knows what's true, what's not. If you can just show me how to eat where I can just lose the, these little, you know, 15 pounds that I want and then sustain it. She said, I know I can do it. So I, I've, I've got it. I, I'll get it done, but I need the knowledge. And so that's why we even do these research reviews. I think the, the more times you guys are exposed to some of the underpinnings of, of what we teach in textbooks and so forth, it just really does give us you know, a, a deeper understanding. So I'm going to go ahead and back out of the screen share so that you guys can ask questions. I've got the studies uh, close to me here on another screen. I can see if you guys have any specific questions. But I will say um, it, it's almost difficult to pull out too many facts that you can just hang your hat on 
in a meta analysis that has so many different variables. Like I said, when I, I can see why like that one group went from 1600 studies down to 18, because they're really trying to, you know, find a narrow focus. So many other studies in, in all three of these were, were really all over the place looking at so many different things. So uh, any, any questions that you guys have in terms of just being able to apply this or looking at the, the information deeper? Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, what I'm thinking is um, when they said exercise, are we talking about cardio? Are we talking about resistant training or did they just lump everything together? Most of the time it was, it started with cardio. Uh, there were some, there, there were studies that were way more specific than others. But uh, most of the time it was, it was just to move. It was just to burn calories and, and going into, you know, nothing, nothing as specific as, you know, here's this powerlifting or hypertrophy program and, and do it this methodically or work with a trainer. It was m most of them. And this is the, this is one value point because, you know, every, every study can be dramatically different, but I tend to really put a lot of weight on those studies that give us a little bit more of a natural environment, or, or at least I separate the two in my mind. If we're looking at very specific criteria, Dan, and testing them, then yes, I want, I want serious controls. But sometimes it's good to just tell people, hey, here's this, like go do with it what you will, because that's the normal experience in human life is people are going to be buying a book or hiring a coach or just downloading a course from YouTube or something. And so you have to be able to just give somebody an intervention and see how they do without a lot of hyper control that, that won't necessarily be there when the study's over. So I, I, I like both, but I like to separate them and look at them as two different entities. So for example, the woman you were talking about this morning, if she said she liked to um, ride her bike, uh, that'd be just fine. And if she said she'd like to go to the gym and do Zumba, you'd say, okay, that's just fine. You just go with what she enjoys just to get her moving. Would that be the case as a coach? Yeah, uh, you know, and that's incredibly important. So you, you were on the Nutrition Coaching Global Mastermind this week where we talked about the moralization of healthism. And this is why this point is important because as a fitness or health professional, if we constantly give people the messaging that, oh, no, no, okay, that's good, but this is better. Okay, you could go to your Zumba class, you know, but but then in a month or so, I want you to start this program, and then we're going to do this, and then it's just like progress, 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 progress. Sometimes we just need to ask people, like, what do you like? You know, let's do something that you're going to enjoy that you can sustain, and if their organic experience leads them somewhere else, that's fine. But if if we as health and nutrition and fitness professionals are constantly telling people that there's this magical hierarchy and if you just do it this way, then you'll be living your best life. Well, who's to say? Like maybe that's their worst life. You know, maybe they would have had a much happier, better life if they had never seen you at all. You know, because they would have done something more along their own path. Sure, makes a lot of sense. Thanks. But I, I do. I mean, I like to. Uh, I mean, I am a teacher just by instinct. And so even though I want people to have all the tools to live the life they want to live, I definitely like to continue to give people the information because if you know, okay, this is what you're doing now, here are some options that you may not have considered. And here are the pros and cons to those. I don't have to be too directive or values-based or judgmental in just presenting information and letting other people decide. Gotcha. But uh, the, yeah, we, we've done some good research reviews too on like we have on the science of cardio and so forth that really gets into the numbers of fat loss per different type of activity. But anybody else have any thoughts or questions about this information so far today? Go ahead, Heather. Now, I was just wondering, does the quality of the exercise, meaning not necessarily whether it's cardio or weightlifting or what type of activity, but the quality of it matter as much, or is it the discipline of exercising that keep that has a tendency to keep you focused on continually continuing to eat well and do what you need to do that has the beneficial effect in the long term? 
Such a good question, Heather. I I was going to launch right into that based on Dan's, uh, you know, prompt, but but you even give a, a, a wider context for it. So I'm, I'm going to go back and quote again from our Nutrition Coaching Global Mastermind this week, and that our guest host, Tom Bainbridge from the UK, he said something that was kind of a brilliant mic drop, and I don't think a lot of people would ever catch this. Uh Either our facilitating host, uh, Dr. Fondero, or somebody, you, you know, he, he somehow w- w- was answering a question uh, that is very values based, you know, which is better? Or if we do this, then what about this? And if that is this, then, then that changes this. And, and he said this he said, well, it seems like that's more of an ordering problem than anything. And in my mind, I could just see like this, this mic drop because. What he's saying is we as humans are always looking for a yes, no answer, a right, wrong answer, a a good, bad, you know, tell me what to do. There's there. If, if you tell me that this is the right thing, quote unquote, everything else is wrong because I found the right thing. And he brought to that perspective in that moment that it's just a matter of sequencing. So Heather uh, the answer to all of your questions there is yes, 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 and more yes, because it's all in the matter of order. So if somebody is, is just getting started with, with a pretty low level of activity, and all we're doing is getting them to go outside and walk for 20 minutes, three times a week, and then it's 30 minutes, three times a week, and then it's walking a little faster, and then maybe it's jogging from this stop sign to that stop sign. You know, now we're increasing the quality but to your first question, it's absolutely the consistency and the habit. You know, that's what has to be there. But we do also know there are tons and tons of variables that can make different types of training more effective or just different than others. So if, if you went back to our, uh, our research review on the science of cardio, you'll see, you know, as we go through the different energy systems that we train through, and, and I use this example this week in one of our sessions where, you know, I can, I can walk on a treadmill and I can, I can just walk as fast as I possibly can before I can barely not count it as a jog. And I can even go on an incline and I'll never get my heart rate over 120. I mean, I've, I test that theory every day, but then I get on a bike and I can crank up the resistance. I can push harder. I can, I can go faster against that higher resistance I can get my heart rate up to 150 or 160. It's really tough to get it much higher than that, but that's a big jump above walking because now I have that extra resistance. I'm, when I'm walking, it's a lot of skeletal motion and very light muscular control. The bike, I have to grind and push. Well, then I go to an arc trainer. So now I'm back to being cl- in, in a closed kinetic chain position. I'm, I'm on my feet, total body weight, and I'm using resistance with all four arms and legs. And now I can just instantly get my heart rate up to 180. And if I push really hard, I can get up to 200 uh, and beyond. So there we're now looking at the quality of exercise in at least one metric, which is just resistance. And, and I'm using more muscle tissue, you know, upper and lower body. So you're creating a bigger metabolic demand that's actually creating strength and mitochondrial change in the muscle in, in, in more space in my body. So more muscle tissue throughout my whole body. I'm orthopedically creating more demand. So there's potential better bone density uh, impact. Uh, so I'm, you know, heart rate, you know, cardiovascular strength, muscular strength, bone strength. The, the more I do, the more benefit I'm going to have and in, in that one research review, I showed that you can, you can get all the way up to a thousand percent increase in both circulating growth hormone and epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are your adrenaline hormones from doing super, super high intensity cardio. So if I go walk for 30 minutes, sure, my heart rate doubles, my heart rate's 80 to 100. I'm burning an extra couple hundred calories. I'm getting some fresh air. It's movement. It's great. But if I went out and sprinted, did interval sprints for those 20 minutes, if I was conditioned to do that, I had worked myself up, then I can get to that point where I have a 
thousand percent greater circulating epinephrine and norepinephrine, which means that's, that's the, your biggest marker of fat loss. So I'm going to burn a lot more body fat by doing that. Uh, increased growth hormone. So I'm going to get, uh, you know, much, much greater recovery for any of the resistance work I'm doing. I'm going to get actually stronger. So, so to go back to answering this as an ordering event, I don't want you to hear me say that one way of exercising or one form of exercise or higher, more aggressive exercise is always the best thing because it starts with what you're going to do consistently and, and get all of those benefits and, and, and tap through all of that safety. And as you condition yourself forward, if there are other things you want to do, then exercise will always be that long-term piece. Uh, I, I'm going to throw Dan back in here as an example. Dan is, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to give away his, his total age, but he's, he's above 60. Uh, you could say I'm 63. That's okay. 63. Okay. Uh, and he's in the best shape of his life. You know, I mean, more muscle mass, more strength, uh, leaner than ever. Cause he's actually just a couple of weeks away from a physique sport contest, but he's a guy who for the last 20 or 30 years, you know, before we met, you know, he was, he was running, you know, every week he was putting some miles on the pavement. He was doing push-ups and sit-ups and, you know, taking care of himself. But now he's just decided I, I want it all. You know, I want the best strength I can get. I want to be the, in the best condition. I want to, I want to look my best. So I, I think there's always great space for personal challenge and all of that, Heather, but our red line, our, our line in the sand has to be what's the level of health and functionality that I feel like I can sustain. Like if I, if I never got any less healthy than this, like this is my, this is my baseline standard for, for where I want to be. I think that should always include enough exercise and training of different forms for you to truly love the life you're living. Cause that's, that's another thing my, my new client said this morning as she sat in front of me. She's like, I just, you know, it's just not fun anymore. Like I'm, I'm less healthy. I'm not as strong. I'm not as fit. I, you know, you, you don't enjoy life like that. And I'm like, yeah, you don't, you know, and, and it takes somebody who's been on both sides to realize that. But I hope that answers your question, Heather. If, if not, please jump in to, uh, to get me back on track. But I, I, I do think it's, it's a matter of order and, and personal preference. Nope, that definitely answered it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Heather. Go, go Dan. Yeah, I got a quick, uh, that made me think that as a coach, we can keep that in our back pocket to see how people progress because this woman that you were talking about, you know, she loses 15 pounds. She sees that body transformation. And she might say, hey, I want to go a little bit further. And so we can, you know, we have these things to add. Because I've got a guy right now, he asked me, um, should I quit powerlifting or should I start bodybuilding training like you? And have good thing we've been talking about this for the last month or so, because I said, no, uh, don't do what I do, do what you enjoy the most. So I wanted him to stick with this. I said, as long as you stick with resistance training based on your goals, uh, your preference. So I think that because of the way online the internet training has gone you know you've got these people who put themselves out there you know do as i do and you'll look as i look and i think that's a little bit dangerous and so he asked me about cardio last week and he said well what are you doing and so i had to tell him well i'll tell you what i do but I'm getting ready for, you know, a, a national bodybuilding contest. That's not your goal. You just want to look good for a wedding. So why don't we hit your goal of 15 pounds? Then we could discuss where we can go from there. So I think it, at least for me, being new in the business, it, I have to watch to fall. Don't fall into the trap because I really think that the internet has gotten people into thinking, oh, Dan's older, I'm older. I'll do what he does. I'll look like and feel like he does. And that's dangerous. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll confirm what you just said there, Dan, in that this, this new client of mine, as we were sitting there and, and at the end of our conversation, you know, she said, okay, I'm in, let's do this. I'm ready to go. And so I, I pulled out my little diet doc fit lab 
you know, service option sheet. And I said, you know, for uh, nutrition only, like if you and I just tackle nutrition and I'm going to give you all the support, here's how that works. No contract, no obligation. It's, it's $99 a month plus a little programming fee. And then if you want to add the, the training programming with that, here's the cost. And then if you want to add the training programming and come in here and do the training, you know, here's that cost. So one, two, three, three options. And uh, she started talking about how, well, tell me about the, the training programming. Like, what would, I, what would I get? What would you do? And it's because she said, I know, even though I don't like it, I really need it. And, and I, I said, look, I said, I'm actually not going to let you do that today. I said, just start with nutrition. Let's get that, you know, moving. Let's get it going. Let's see how you feel. And I said, because you have done some exercise in the past, I said, I'm more than happy to help you with some instruction. Like I can tell you what I think is reasonable, what you should do. I, but for, for the reason you said, Dan, I didn't want to quote, sell her things that would just maybe overwhelm her or that she just doesn't really need, or she may find she doesn't want. So I would much rather as a business model, as a, as a health professional say, let's get you in with the, the most minimum effective dose in several ways of describing that phrase, like the least amount of money, the least amount of commitment. I want to earn your trust. I want you to see how this goes. And then if there are places you feel you can go that you may flourish better, I think those will emerge through our process. You know, neither you nor I can predict all that right now. And, and, I, and I think that's truly the best way for people even just cognitively to progress. Give me one thing I can work on. Let me feel comfortable with that. Gain some competence, see some results. Now I'm excited. Now, now give me another challenge. Give me another challenge. Give me another challenge. But if we just, we just pile all of these expectations and all these things on top of people, you know, just, just probably not going to give us the same results. And not only is it a great business model, I think it's a great relationship builder uh, and a trust builder uh, because uh, you're demonstrating your competency in a sense that you know uh, uh, what's best, uh, but letting her choose at the same time uh, so that when she chooses to say, come in the gym, right? It's her choice and you can bump it to the next level and she becomes a raving fan, not just a satisfied customer. Yep. So I love it. Yeah, it's, you know, the, the, the more you get to know me, you'll know that I'm, I'm as anti-materialist as they come. You know, it's, I, I'm, I, I would do this for free and, and be homeless myself if that's what it took for me to help people. But, um, you know, the, the, the one thing I don't want to lose sight of too, guys, we did, we did another research review several months ago. And in a couple, you know, one particular group did a big data analysis. They, they picked apart retrospectively the Minneapolis starvation study. And in that same research review, um, other people who had done some meta analyses on, on the most effective approaches to body fat loss, uh, they, they all concluded, and this is just a reminder for you guys, that at the end of it all, when the dust settles and you're looking at something like five years out, and when we see, like I said, in one particular study, uh, everybody five years out from starting a diet, the average weight was 107% of the starting weights collectively. So obviously some people probably had lost weight and kept it off, but the aggregate weight loss or weight gain was that all of these people together weighed 7% more than when they started. So the, the conclusions of these researchers were that all of the long-term lasting results we get are truly from exercise. It's truly from movement. Because in the last 20, 30, 40 years, we as, as humans, sure, we're eating more calories. We're eating like an extra two to 300 calories per person across the globe. Uh, per day, but we're also moving as Americans about 500 to 1,000 calories less per day. So when you look at every single behavior change, 
And then just our own instincts, our own impulses to eat or not eat, to eat better or eat worse. It's the fact that the person who is doing the most training, the most exercise as a stable expenditure of calories has so many other things going for them. Physiologically, they're just burning body fat more efficiently, even at rest. But they're also probably somebody, if they're taking that intentional, intentional space every day or every week to train, it's in their mind to be a little bit more health conscious, right? You don't, you don't go invest that hour on the treadmill and then go s- sit down and eat an ice cream sundae. Like every, everybody will tell you that, that, you know, my behaviors really kind of hinge on this or this or this, whatever we value the most, whatever we have moralized uh, as, as an important part of our lives, that tends to hold a lot of other behaviors in its pocket. It really does. And, and that's, that's why the exercise is that long-term anchor. But also, this is where I get back to the ordering of events. And it's not just one answer versus another. But if all we did was exercise, remember in these meta-analyses that, that, that those were always in last place because you're not learning anything about nutrition. You're not learning what you really need. So, you know, in that order, you almost have to front load things, which is let's, let's get nutrition underway. Let's get that learning. Let's get those experiences under our belt so we can get to know it. And now let's start working on the forever pieces, which are sustainability strategies, which includes exercise and movement. So that, that's kind of the bottom line as I looked at these guys is that, you know, obviously we, we knew instinctively that it's going to be diet plus exercise that's better than diet or exercise. But the fact that both of those components have more of a chronological piece and then a synergy that works together, you know, after, you know, both are accomplished, you know, that's a, that, that's a, that's a big answer, I think, for us. Go ahead, Steve, you jumping in? Uh, yeah. I think, I think uh, Dan and you both just just hit the nail on the head um you know what 15 16 years i've been with you we've been doing this you actually were here and had a meeting with a client that i suggested let's just dial in your diet and get you set and and dialed in with macros and so forth because i knew the lady that i was talking to um wanted to see scale change and I knew that she would see it right away with, with the nutrition, as opposed to day one starting weight training and nutrition and probably seeing a little bit of flaws due to some inflammation and water retention and not being as excited about seeing a scale go down as people do. Um, and I don't know if you remember that meeting and her husband was aggravated because I told her not to exercise, but he was. I do. Now that you said that, I do remember. You remember? And and it was not the case in point. He misinterpreted the information. Um, I've just learned over the years, especially with women, middle-aged women, that they're really happy when they see weight change, their weight drop. And, and it does make it more efficient for myself to really dial them in on their macro levels they need as a sedentary person. And then they become excited to lift. Then I could give them the information. Listen, when you start to lift your first week or two, you may see a, a slight slowdown in weight loss, but you're on a scale, but you're still doing well. It's just some other things that's going on, some density, some water retention from some soreness, inflammation, and then you'll see a rapid drop. And and that's worked well for me, uh, starting nutrition only and graduating then mildly into training has worked much better than trying to get people to both train. Another interesting fact was I've had I have two clients now that that were members of my gym for 15 years, frequent exercisers, husband, wife, obviously no change in physical structure. He had a, a a pacemaker put in. He got a little bit scared. Uh, Came to me. He was diabetic. She has had some problems and they've lost 30 and he's lost 30 pounds 
and he's got normal blood sugar. She's lost 20 in not even six months. In 15 years of exercise, they've lost nothing. Yeah. And, and now they see, they said, I said, think if you would have done this 15 years ago. As same as the people that work out seven days a week, two hours a day, killing themselves, trying to lose weight. And you can get them into three days a week in the gym and eat right and change your physique tremendously. It makes big differences. So. Nice. Yeah. And uh, I, oh, go ahead, Steve. I'm good. I, I was going to say, that's, a, that's probably a great point for us to wrap up the week. And that is that, um, you know, making one significant, meaningful change at a time is, is best. We know that through habit formation research and all that. But at the same time, I, I definitely don't want to get you guys away from the, the fact that progressive training and getting healthier and, and looking at new ways to challenge yourself physically is, is I think it's a lot of fun. You may not think it's a lot of fun, but the results are always great. The results are, you know, when you feel yourself getting stronger, you feel yourself, you know, the agility coming back, the stamina, there's just nothing like it. And this, this couple, I, I've, I've mentioned this to you guys so many times, you're sick of hearing it, but, but she said it again, just as they were walking out of my facility this week, the couple who's lost 20 and 15 pounds and they had never really worked out before, you know, starting with in June with me, she turned around as they were leaving again. And this is the third time she's told me this. She said, this is by far the best thing we've ever done for ourselves. They've been married 31 years. Uh, they're both in their mid fifties. And they said these last two and a half months, just, just the amount of change we made in two and a half months is the single best thing we've ever done for ourselves. And this is a couple who kind of went in to the deep end. You know, they, they, they got the nutrition with me, the, the programming and support. They got the training programming and support, but they're inside my facility with me pounding them two to three times a week. And, you know, two and a half months ago, that pounding may have started with 10 minutes on the treadmill and a couple sets of body weight squats, you know, now, you know, he's deadlifting 200 pounds. Now he's leg pressing 500 pounds. Now he's doing, you know, flat, flat bench dumbbell presses with 50 pound dumbbells. He's doing these things as a guy who's never worked out. Like imagine how that feels to go from pretty sedentary to all of a sudden feeling like an athlete for the first time in your life. To, to, I mean, that was my first love. You know, that's that's what got me into this as a as a life and as a career was when I was 11 years old and I started working out for the first time as a as a pudgy little overweight kid who had never done anything athletic. That you know that was my genesis story, and uh, and and that's what gets me excited seeing people live that. So when I when I keep coming back to the point that through these meta analyses that that the exercise and the training is that that anchor point that will stabilize your your fitness and health life forever. It truly, truly, truly is. But I'd hope you find a way to really enjoy it. You know, explore, find different ways to be athletic and, and do what you like. You know, Dan, Dan said that perfectly. 